Starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Beyond Scanning, Delivering Impact-Driven Vulnerability Assessments. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Matthew Toussaint, SANS instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the, web, hand the webcast over to Matthew. Good morning, everyone, and thanks again for uh, joining us this morning at this uh, webcast. Hopefully, we have something fairly special for you today, and uh, we can learn some things together and see what more there is out there that we can explore and uh, use to make our vulnerability assessment, specifically in this case, a little bit better, more powerful, more impactful for whoever the organization is, even be it our own organization, when we're performing these types of assessments. Now, as we go through the webinar today, please feel free to use the questions window inside a GoToMeeting to ask any questions, and I'll attempt to answer them as they come up, such that we can kind of approach those questions on specific si slides or material in which we're currently focusing on. That said, we'll also have a question and answer section at the very end of today's webcast where we can explore additional questions or whatever else might come up. But please don't hesitate and feel free to ask questions as uh, you think them up. Here we go. So today's webinar is based on a specific thing that we're working on here at SANS, and it's the next thing. At SANS, we like to keep all the material as fresh as possible. We do this a little bit in every single course and the updates we perform on a regular basis. But every now and then, we realize that there's maybe a segment of the market that's growing or becoming a new thing. You see this with a new uh, cyber threat emulation course that SANS has at the day. But in this case, we've, we look at the SANS uh, spectrum of penetration testing courses, and we realize there's a little bit of a gap. Whereas 560, the pen testing course, is generally led into by the 504 hacker tools, techniques, exploits, and incident handling course it's not exactly direct parallel because they're, they're kind of peered services. There's no vulnerability assessment course. We talk about it in 560, talk about it a little in 504, but there's nothing that really focuses in on that topic specifically and allows us to approach how to perform one and get the most value out of them. So that's a little bit about what, what's, the, uh, what's the emphasis from this uh, webinar because it's a preview into some of the 460 material. In fact, some of these slides are exactly what we'll be coming into the new course uh, when we finally get it released here in the uh, beginning of 2018, hopefully. All right. With that, let's jump into what we're going to talk about today. Specifically, uh, we're not going to cover a full six days worth of material all in one day. However, we can certainly get ourselves somewhat close to approximating the same kind of value. Specifically, we're going to jump into a vulnerability assessment and kind of explore the life cycle of a vulnerability and how we can make that smaller, right? We don't want these critters to have a long going retirement plan. We don't want them to buy into social security. We wanna kill the suckers as soon as we possibly can. That's what we're gonna kind of explore here with this webinar, using vulnerability assessment as a tool to identify them and shorten that life cycle as much as possible. The key focus there, of course, is iterability. When we do a vulnerability assessment, and let's say it's the best vulnerability assessment of our life, it's absolutely outstanding. We wanna make sure that the next time we do a vulnerability assessment, it's just as good, or at least somewhere close. And so iterability, having a process and methodology to be able to recreate that same best vulnerability assessment of your life over and over again is a key portion of vulnerability assessment. Now, an easy way, of course, to hand wave that is to open up Nessus, click scan, print the report, and call it a vulnerability assessment. Yes, that's going to have the exact same level of impact, which is to say very little, every time you perform the same vulnerability assessment, but we want to do just a little bit better and add in additional tools and techniques to make our services as outstanding as we possibly can. So we're going to discuss 
more of those tools of the trade, a little bit of introduction as well, so Nessus be an example, but what other things can you bring to your vulnerability assessment to create a more holistic perspective of what the severity cases are of different vulnerabilities? Then we'll do a little bit of a guided walkthrough so through a simple assessment. This will get our kind of the gears grow, going in our, in our minds so that we can truly see from a high level perspective what a vulnerability assessment is and what pieces and components are moving that we can attack directly in order to do good risk assessments, move into triage, and eventually remediation so that we can shorten the life cycle of these vulnerabilities as much as possible. In order to do that though, specifically triage, we'll need to have a good understanding, an idea of what the actual risk is from a vulnerability. The difficulty with vulnerability assessment is that since, as opposed to penetration testing, we're not exploiting the vulnerabilities that we find as we find them. We're just triggering, we're, we're just identifying them, we're discovering them, and then we have to somehow magically come to a true risk rating that limits as much as possible the number of, let's say, false positives that exist at the end of the assessment, but also emphasizes that value proposition as much as possible. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Then we'll do a little exercise where we calculate some of those risks given that pen test scenario that we've kind of walked through. And then we'll look at some opportunities and techniques to use PowerShell and Windows Remote Management in order to mass validate and rapidly remediate so that we're spending a lot more time discovering, spending a lot more time digging into the weeds on what's cool, as opposed to focusing in on a preliminary, just thin level of the actual network and its security we can drive deeper because we're not spending as much time on the, let's say, boring pieces of the test that are the same command over and over again. We can just run them once and get mass effect at the same time. To jump into the vulnerability assessment, with 460, we're releasing a vulnerability assessment framework. It's kind of like the hacker's methodology in 560, but in this case, it's focused specifically on vulnerability assessments and almost even from a project planning methodology or perspective as well. What you have with project management professionals, say PMP, GCPM, the SANS variant of that, is a large scope of inputs and outputs so that you can drive a process that's going to stay the same each time and make sure that you guarantee good effects at the end of it. In this case, we're building the same vulnerability assessment framework around that same kind of perspective. The idea is, as we go into each phase of a vulnerability assessment, there's certain things that have to be done or certain information components that we need to be a little bit apprised of in order to then move on to the next piece. We might start off the engagement with planning and then move into threat modeling. In order to do these kinds of things, we need to have communication with the customers. We need to identify what information's in scope. If we're a third party vulnerability assessor as opposed to an in-house vulnerability assessment team, we may have access to different kinds of information. And in fact, we may have generated things like network maps, and patch management processes ourselves for that organization. But none of these things are guaranteed, so we have to be able to work with or without them. Moving to threat modeling allows us to truly identify what the threat is and what pieces of information or systems or access or SCADA-based sabotage a target may be going after inside that specific organization's condition. So threat modeling gives us some perspective on that. Then we move into Phase three and four, discovery and vulnerability scanning uh, in general. Specifically, with those two phases, we're gathering a massive amount of data regarding the environment that we're performing vulnerability assessment for. And that brings us into the next two phases, validation and remediation, without truly being able to understand and parse down that data, or at the very least, rack and stack it such that we know what the important pieces are and have those rise to the top. It's going to be difficult for us to actually take a vulnerability assessment and provide mass value. For instance, if there is an internal organization, let's say, we've done a vulnerability scan for them. They've got a thousand or more internal systems, and a fair number of them might be unique. In that case, we may very, very well have our work cut out for us if we're going to perform the same level of value as an attacker may approach when they engage the network with the intent of installing, let's say, ransomware. In that case, their value proposition at the end of the assessment might be, well, I'm going to hold these people's information hostage and extort them for money. I'm looking for $1.2 million. Well, we're not going to quite have that same budget, if you will, 
in a normal vulnerability assessment or any kind of security assessment or service, generally speaking. But we can do our best to get a same level of holistic perspective and jump into the middle of that, at least to some degree. Security is, of course, mathematically improvable, and we can't get everything, but we can absolutely hit all of the high ends, all the high pieces. We can do a little bit better than Equifax. All right, that moves us into the reporting, and with reporting, of course, that's where our value truly comes, because if we're not the same folks doing the remediation, just discovering vulnerabilities is only gonna provide limited value. Today, however, we're gonna jump straight into three and four, phase three and four, and just do a little bit on both sides, because this is the meat and potatoes of, say, the methodology behind doing vulnerability assessments. What is vulnerability scanning? What kind of tools can we use for that? What kind of tricks can we approach in order to find the critical pieces of information, the critical vulnerabilities that are the crux of the vulnerability assessment we're performing? We're gonna focus in on that here, just for a little while. So with a vulnerability assessment, our inputs tend to start off with the target matrix, right? What's in scope? You may in fact call this a scope, and if you come from the penetration testing community, you most likely do. So given a, tar a set of targets, a scope, we then perform vulnerability assessment, and then at the end of that, we should be able to produce a vulnerability assessment report, perhaps even a remediation plan, in order to get the organization from wherever it is today to the maximum amount of value we can perform for them towards the end. With vulnerability assessments, the biggest tool, the one we always focus in on, is that vulnerability scanner. I want to split these up for us for just a moment here, though, because vulnerability scanners and the vulnerability scanning tools will most certainly tell you that they're capable of detecting and scanning and identifying, discovering, if you will, all the vulnerabilities in your environment. And to be fair, tools like Nexus or Nexpose most certainly have the ability to scan for and detect vulnerabilities for specific types of systems. Let's take Nexus as an example. Nexus has the ability to do web application scanning. However, I would posit that it probably doesn't nearly as well as a tool that's based on that specific application and focuses on scanning it directly, something like IBM App Scan or say Acunetics as an, as, an, as an alternative example. Not to say that any tool is the best at anything or that they don't have a little bit of cross play, but in vulnerability assessment, oftentimes we start off with phase two discovery. We identify all the systems, we do some NMAP scanning, we see what's out there in the environment, and then we move into a general purpose vulnerability scanner like Nessus. We should also realize that once we identify applications, we go beyond just port 80 is open, that means web applications are being used in the environment. There's, we go to browse the website, we find that there's a WordPress site available. We should use tools beyond simple Nessus or Nikto in order to identify that. In this specific example case, we use NMAP to identify that the systems are right there in the environment. We see port 80, we browse to it, get some more information about the website. We use Nessus to determine vulnerabilities, we use a tool like Nikto in order to scan the web server to identify vulnerabilities that may be web server related or configuration of, say, an Apache server, uh, bad conditions like that. We'll explore some of those here during our actual vulnerability assessment example and walkthrough. And then since it's a WordPress site, we may want to use a application specific scanning tool like WP Scan in order to get higher fidelity results and information on the vulnerabilities there. It's kind of an iterative process in vulnerability identification going from the most broad down to the most specific, where Nikto and WP Scan, in this example, are both different application-specific scanners, but they have higher levels of fidelity and different focuses. With a general purpose scanner, and we'll explore here general purpose scanning just as an example to, uh, to drive the use case, specifically because these are a little bit easier to just uh, model in your mind. So the general purpose scanner, Oftentimes we begin with scanning, and scanning again is phase two. It's not quite vulnerability discovery here yet. But with scanning, we're looking to discover assets, identify services that are on them, and potentially start banner grabbing those services to see what they're actually running, what version of that service they're running. Vulnerability testing and scanning here start to meet their gray area. Where scanning may end with service detection, identifying the ports that are open, say port scan. Vulnerability testing, takes that information and attempts to find out if there's publicly known, disclosed vulnerabilities associated with maybe an exploit condition or alternatively, a poor configuration setting. We'll find that in vulnerability testing, configuration management 
and improper configurations lead to vulnerabilities that attackers are much more capable of exploiting than most exploits. These days, exploitation is not the number one way that attackers engage an environment. They're normally just taking advantage of inherent capabilities, you might say, in the environment. Windows, essentially, taking advantage of how those systems are generally administered in order to drive their attack. And so we'll explore both of these here in just a moment. The key point here is when we move from scanning to vulnerability testing, we're moving from service detection into banner grabbing. But both of these two types of scanning, say Nmap with a dash SV option that does banner grabbing, vulnerability testing requires that information in order to correlate and validate that a vulnerability actually exists. So they, they play very well together and one is required for the other to work, a bit of subordinate relationship. The key point here is if we do scanning with Nmap, the vulnerability tool that we use next may actually do the exact same thing as Nmap and then jump into the scan. So sometimes we can eliminate some of this extra work, some of the extra time and packets that get sent on the environment by importing scan results into the vulnerability tool, often via XML, those kind of things. For a vulnerability test to work, essentially what you're doing is grabbing the banner of the service that lets you know the version. Let's say that it is Apache version five or Tomcat or whatever it might be, Tomcat seven. It's especially interesting these days with all of the Java server applications, Apache struts style vulnerabilities that are um, that have been disclosed. Three zero days since March, all of the remote code execution, very bad. Good for us to be able to identify those and detect those. The interesting point with struts vulnerabilities though, is that in order to find out if that vulnerability actually exists, we can't just scan the system and then use that banner to find out if it's got an older version. In some cases, we actually have to throw an exploit at that service and see if we run code on the remote end, see if it's vulnerable, see if it actually does what an attacker might do. If it does, well, we know it's vulnerable. But the point is, a vulnerability scanner might not be able to identify a vulnerability via vulnerability correlation, grabbing the banner and then detect, checking to see if that version has a publicly disclosed vulnerability to it. It may need to validate the vulnerability directly, and it would do this by actually throwing the exploit and seeing if it runs, seeing if it works. Something to be aware of, something that might be dangerous when we're doing vulnerability assessment. But it also helps eliminate, or at least limit, the count of false positives we may have while doing an assessment. With traditional scanning, again, the focus is on asset discovery into identification and enumeration. So finding the systems, enumerating what services they may have on them, moving into port scanning, and then version scanning in order to detect the services. Version scanning has that cross play with vulnerability assessment insofar as that's the key piece of information you need to be able to do to drive that vulnerability correlation. When it comes into scanning, an example here might be for asset discovery, we've got an IP address range that's in our scope, 192.168.0.0 slash 24. So that would be one through 255. When we scan through that range, we identify hosts that are up. Nice. So we have systems. Next, we begin port scanning. We port scan the system in order to identify services that may be up. Port discovered, we find that port TCP 111 is open on a system. That's for the network file sharing protocol. And now we can start doing service detection. We browse to NFS on port 111, find out what the version of that service is, and we see if we can access it. Now, vulnerability scan in that specific case might be, okay, we found that NFS is there. Now we acquire the version number of that NFS and we start to correlate to see if there's any vulnerabilities. Okay, not, not this time. No known vulnerabilities for the version of NFS that's installed. So far, so good. At least they're secure there. The next test we might do has nothing to do with an exploit at all, but is absolutely valid from the perspective of vulnerability detection. We try logging on. We might try logging on with no username, no password. Does it work? Hmm, looks like it does. If it does, we wanna see if we might have the permissions to read data off that share, to write data to that share, or to modify stuff that already exists. In that case, we may log on with no credentials, try to write data. Okay, it looks like we can write data. How do we see that we can actually write the data? We read it back off the share. I write, hello, Matthew is here. Then I read it back off. Oh, hello, Matthew is here. We see that. And then we should delete that on our way out. 
we've now gone through a full vulnerability test against that one service for that one system. In this case, we did it manually. Oftentimes, a tool like Nessus might do this automatically for us. But if it does, we should manually validate that vulnerability to make sure that Nessus, perhaps, doesn't have a false positive condition associated with it. And then we need to brainstorm. For instance, okay, Nessus found this vulnerability and it ranks it as a three. That's a low, not too dangerous, not too good, but it's, it's a thing, it's there. Is it actually low severity or is there some additional intrinsic risk that might be associated? Let's say, for instance, that the system actually has a backup of their SQL database for an e-commerce website on that NFS share and it's publicly readable, publicly writable. Suddenly, we've got a PCI DSS concern because there's credit card information stored on that NFS share that's publicly readable, publicly writable. Suddenly, this becomes a big deal. You would rank that a critical. Nessus won't be able to tell you this. Automated scanning tools, of course, have a limitation insofar as they don't know what data matters. And as vulnerability assessors, that's really where we come in and start to drive in that impact. What does the data matter? What does the fact that we found this vulnerability, what does it matter? Finally, we move into the actual reporting. With a report, you should generally include your scanner output such that a remote tester could, re, uh, could recreate the scanning results or really see what the raw signals intelligence, if you will, actually exists. But the report must go substantially beyond just raw data. We want to highlight in what the true things are, what the nexus points of their network's information security actually is. We'll explore that here next. Specifically, with vulnerabilities, where do they come from? Well, vulnerabilities could come from anything. Just how the system's built. Is a system coded incorrectly? Can we take advantage of that? In any case, if we correlate that to operational risk or organizational risk, we've got two general categories, identification and mitigation. With mitigation, we're looking for a measurement. We're looking to measure the vulnerability itself and identify how we might be able to soften the blow, let's say. For instance, we might be able to mitigate the potential for a vulnerability to actually exist without knowing that one's there. If we use something like a web application firewall as an example and put that in front of a web application that was running in a struts type uh, application on the back end, is struts still vulnerable? Maybe, maybe, but there's the opportunity that by layering these security controls, the risk has been mitigated, at least to some extent. We should certainly not overlook the vulnerability just because we have layered security, but if there have been layered security controls, and let's say Nessus tells us, okay, the system's vulnerable, but you realize, well, the system's been configured with SE Linux, even if an adversary were to exploit it, the amount of access or vulnerability they'd truly be able to trigger is mitigated, then you might actually take your risk rating and go from the Nessus 8, right, it's a high, and bring that down to a 6. We can go both ways off of these, and the ability to do that is what makes us vulnerability assessors and makes our tests impactful. On the opposite side, with risk management, we really need to develop that risk management culture where we're doing threat assessments on a regular basis in order to find these vulnerabilities and then continuously developing controls to mitigate the risk whether one vulnerability is found or if it's not. So with business risk, there's generally speaking a large number of different types, anywhere from strategic to compliance, financial or reputational risk. The weird part about cybersecurity risk is that it actually takes a component of all of the other categories of risk and use that as a holistic risk proposition. For instance, if your website gets hacked and defaced, well, there's some reputational risk associated with that. If your website's an e-commerce site like Amazon, the financial risk of having downtime is absolutely going to be a big uh, position for you. With cybersecurity risk, it isn't a new kind of risk. Cybersecurity is just like any other risk, but it's based off of a large kind, a large number of risks that we already deal with on a regular basis and that risk managers tend to be pretty well versed in. This provides us a bit of an opportunity when it comes to reporting, because if we know that a report's gonna be read by somebody whose focus is continuity of operations or risk management, we can speak in their exact same kind of verbiage or same kind of syntax without focusing in on the technical controls, and we can speak the same language, 
develop additional value. This is nice. The key point here, though, is with risk, risk isn't just a number. And your scanning systems will normally provide just a number. When we're penetration testing, when we find a vulnerability or an exploit, we can attack that and we can see what's on the opposite side. So we get a bit better of an idea of what the real risk actually is. In vulnerability assessment, that's where a limitation is. Sure, we can discover all the vulnerabilities, but actual active exploitation and then post-exploitation in order to determine what bad, what could really go wrong if somebody were to attack this, that tends to be a little outside the scope. It's not to say that vulnerability assessment is a lesser service to penetration testing. It's to say that it's much broader. With a penetration test, oftentimes you may only get through 5% of a whole network. Did we get a true assessment of what the risk is for that network, for that organization? Perhaps. But the likelihood is, with a penetration test, we probably missed some things. We probably missed a lot of things. With vulnerability assessments, good vulnerability assessments anyway, we've got the opportunity to get mass access to information and start making assessments on the network as a whole. But we do have that limiting condition as far as how deep we're able to go. To get around this, we have to use a little bit of statistics in order to get the same level of fidelity in results that a penetration test might do just by default because it's already exploiting those conditions. In this case, this brings us to our risk equation. You see this written a number of different ways inside the information security community, but essentially risk, risk outside of information security, just organizational risk is probability times impact. We often talk about it in cybersecurity as threat times vulnerability. This, I think, can be a little bit confusing because when we talk about threat, we're talking about the likelihood. We're talking about probability. It's the threat probability. With the vulnerability, we're talking about what would happen if it were exploited. How bad would that be for my organization? It's the vulnerability severity or the impact rating. They're the same equations, but with Cybersecurity's variant, threat times vulnerability, it tends to be very fairly easy to consider threat to be both probabilistic and impactful, which isn't inaccurate, but it does make things a little bit harder to understand. So think about them more as risk is the probability of a threat taking advantage of a vulnerability, and the severity of that vulnerability were it to be taken advantage of, what's the impact to the organization? Vulnerability magnitude, and then organizational threat conditions. Additionally, there's a couple other pieces of risk. Of course, what isn't just mathematical? What's the human cost? Are people actually in danger because the system controls SCADA devices in the background? Or what kind of countermeasures could we put in place in order to mitigate that vulnerability, mitigation controls again, such that the vulnerability itself, its severity, and the threat itself aren't the only things that drive your risk calculus? Because now we've got mitigation controls that limit what that vulnerability severity actually is, despite the fact that it might be a high. It's a high, but it's a high that is really, really hard to get access to and require, say, three different exploits in order to exploit that final one and give true access. An example of this might be iPhone, right? The iPhone security. Most recent public bid for an iPhone uh, exploit was a million dollar competition. And in that competition, the winning exploit was actually not an exploit for the iPhone. It was three exploits for the iPhone, and you needed to have each one to trampoline between the three in order to get your real remote code execution on an iPhone. Mitigation controls can certainly lower the severity of an individual vulnerability. It's important to realize that severity isn't risk. So when we run Nessus, we run Nexpose, we get that number back. Oh, it's an eight. That's high. But it's a high severity, not risk. If it's a high, but there's no real information on the system, and there's no real danger once it's exploited, is it still a really dangerous risk? The answer is, of course, no, not, not really. In penetration testing, it's easy for us to identify this, because we exploit the system, and we can see what's there. In vulnerability assessment, we don't have that luxury, and we have to use additional pieces of information in order to drive that way. With vulnerabilities, uh, oftentimes we've got vulnerability databases. Let's say we don't use a vulnerability scanner. We use something more like uh, Nmap, we banner grab, and then we use the banner grab, and we put that banner into Google with the word exploit after it. That's essentially vulnerability scanning. That is what it is. If we want to get that severity rating, 
we can look at vulnerability databases. In the case of Nessus, Nessus has its own. Most scanners have their own vulnerability database, be it Rapid7 or Qualys, whatever it might be. There are additionally publicly released and publicly available uh, databases that we can use for vulnerabilities that we may be found ourselves through manual testing or through uh, checking for a vulnerability that was very recently discovered, say Apache Struts three weeks ago, before there's actually a scanner database entry for it. We want to check that. Day one, in that case, Nessus NSE had a scanning module for that one within hours, within hours that vulnerability being discovered. But you would need to correlate it with some kind of CVE details or some kind of vulnerability database in order to give you that severity rating. Again, severity isn't risk, but that doesn't mean that it isn't value added for us. Specifically, one of the easiest ways to calculate risk is to take a severity rating and then go up a number or go down a number, right? Let's say severity rating is an eight, and we decide, well, the system isn't actually that big of a risk, so we'll just take that down by two numbers. In order to make this iterable, in order to make this something that you can qualitatively do every single time, you most likely want to have some kind of grading rubric where a series of true and false questions, standardized true and false questions that you would apply to each vulnerability you discover, would increase the severity rating by a certain number or decrease it by a certain number. The Infocon rubric from the Internet Storm Center works a lot like this. So with Infocon, we're looking for uh, vulnerabilities in general, and if we find them, then Infocon's got a set of questions that it tries to answer regarding each one of the ratings, beginning with a severity rating. So severity rating is a high, let's, let's go on a scale of one to 10, call that an eight. Let's say that it is going to affect the entire internet and potentially cause latency for everyone because it's that bad, well, plus two. It allows remote code execution into people's uh, uh, systems, plus another two. There's no patch for it, plus another two. Oh, but it's only on the internal, minus two, et cetera. You kind of see how this thing goes. And you can develop a risk rating rubric based on true and false questions for your specific organization and its use cases. And that's quite nice. And it's a very easy way to take severity ratings from a vulnerability database and cause them to be a little bit more value added, a little more impactful when performing the same type of calculus, but for your organization specifically. A bit more quantitative style risk assessment might be to instead use a risk assessment matrix or a risk assignment matrix. These are often used in engineering to determine what the risk might be if a bridge were to collapse. What's the risk of it collapsing? Is it very low risk or is it high risk? What happens, about, what happens if there's high winds? How does that affect the risk? And you assign these against a risk assignment matrix in order to remove things like personal biases. If we rate each one of the features, each one of the danger conditions to a certain level, and then we just plot them on the graph, there's very little likelihood, or little chance anyway, of having a personal bias massively change a qualitative-based risk assessment because it's throwing a dart at a random dartboard. We want to avoid that where possible. Risk assi assignment matrixes help out quite well with these. This incidentally is also how OWASP performs its vulnerability assessment ratings and its risk ratings. OWASP has a really, really good risk rating system and equation behind and to drive how it determines what a risk actually is and what the vulnerability condition actually is. It's very nice. I also recommend taking a look at that if you're interested in further uh, um, exploration, further discovery. We'll do something quite similar to the risk assessment matrix from OWASP, though. So let's plot out a security assessment now. In the case of this organization, let's assume that there's a DMZ, and the DMZ's got a publicly available web server. Inside the services enclave, they're doing some good network segmentation stuff. Awesome. Inside their services enclave, there's a SharePoint. And there's also a domain controller, and the domain controller has DNS, because DNS is required for Windows domain to be operable. This is standard. Okay, now they've also got a user enclave. And in the user enclave, there's a file share, pretty typical, and a couple workstations. All right. Now we begin by doing a standard scan, find the ports that are open, the services available, and then perform a vulnerability assessment, right, a vulnerability scan, to find out things that might be there. We do a vulnerability scan with Nessus, general purpose vulnerability scanning, and then we perform another one with, say, Nikto and Acunetics in order to give us application-specific vulnerability detection and discovery. Now we've got data. 
we've got to figure out which matters to us, which is important, which might be a little less so. On the public web server, we find out that it's vulnerable to directory traversal. Nikto found that for us. Nice. We also find that it's got directory indexing uh, enabled. Okay. These might be bad vulnerabilities, and they might be low vulnerabilities. If we were to give the system just an aggregate severity rating just by itself, we'd probably give it a high because directory traversal could be really bad. For instance, with directory traversal, we might be able to expose some of the source code behind the website. If we expose the source code, we're able to read that source code. We might be able to find a vulnerability in it itself by reverse engineering the website itself as opposed to having to hack it and, and develop a zero day from scratch. So directory traversal could be really bad. If we want to, we can assign it a high or whatever the actual situation is concerning the website itself. Moving into the services enclave, now we're on the internal network. We look at the PNI SharePoint and we want to know some information about it. We don't just want to rely on our scanners. At this point, we probably need to talk to the customer. We'll probably do this during the actual planning section. What is your most important thing? What are you worried about? Do you have PCI DSS style concerns? Is there credit card information in your network, in your environment? Do you have PII? Are you the Office of Personnel Management, OPM? Where is your valuable stuff? In this case, the valuable stuff is on the SharePoint. We would rate that piece of information an I for informational. It's not a risk that they store their information in their environment. That's just how their network works. But if it's an informational, and it's an important informational, right? There's a critical customer data. They could be fined tens of thousands of dollars if this were found not to be implemented securely. Then that still matters to us. It matters quite a bit. And we can use that piece of information to determine what the threat model looks like, right? If we're an attacker and we're going after a ransomware style attack, we want to get access to the critical information so that we can encrypt it and then extort our victims for massive amounts of money in order to have their critical information, their business, in essence, decrypted. Suddenly, that SharePoint becomes a much higher priority system. When scanning the SharePoint, Nessus tells us that there is a share on it, and it's world readable and it's world writable. Interesting. Nessus rates it a medium. On scale one to 10, call it a five. We're going to use dual scales one to five here in just a moment. So for mediums, we'll call them threes. We'll see that plotted out here in just a moment, however. Then we do a scan of the D of the domain controller. We find out the domain controller is fully patched. There is nothing wrong with that. Okay. Scanning the user enclave, on the other hand, we find what is a very common vulnerability to find in information networks today. You see them all the time on penetration tests, at least somewhere within the enclave, especially if the systems are, say, 100 or greater. In it. Network of over 100 systems, you will generally find one of them vulnerable to MS17010, also known as the Eternal Blue exploit that came out in April as part of the Equation Group's dump via Shadow Brokers. Okay, we found one system that has that vulnerability. Nessus calls it a critical. Nessus is right, it's bad. That said, some vulnerability severity rating systems will not call it a critical. For instance, CVSS and VolnDB will actually rate this one like uh, a seven or so. As in, it's high, it's bad, but it's not a 10, it's not a critical. This is one of the vo worst vulnerabilities that we have seen this decade. The last vulnerability you might call that is even remotely similar in severity to Eternal Blue, MS17010, would be MS08067, also known as uh, the Conificker exploit, right? The one that really shakes up the entire world. This one is that category of vulnerability. It is that bad. And it's almost exactly 10 years after the fact. So thank you, Microsoft, for your continued patronage to penetration testers as a whole. This brings up a key point. Don't trust automated uh, quantified vulnerability assessment ratings. If CVSS calls it something, that doesn't mean that's what it is. Try to understand the vulnerability behind the scenes a little bit more and see what an attacker would be able to leverage it for. We'll see that here in just a moment. So we found vulnerability for Eternal Blue on one of their internal workstations, but there's no sensitive data on that system at all. Hmm. When scanning, we also may be using credentialed scans inside of Nessus, identify that there's a local administrator that's shared across all their systems. Their IT department is provisioning all the systems and using the same default user account for all of them. It's a strong password, but it's the same shared local admin password. Moving to Workstation 2, it's the Domain Admins Workstation. It's an important box. That would probably be another one of those informational style findings that is of high importance. 
an attacker would definitely want to target that system. They would maybe use a technique called Bloodhound in order to find out which systems a domain admin is logged into. They use that to find the system and that would absolutely be one of their targets. So the threat rating here is high, but the vulnerability rating is of course just informational because there's nothing wrong with the domain ad admin having a workstation. There might be something wrong with the domain admin not having a workstation. Uh, in fact, in that case, he may not actually be doing a job. On the Windows file share, we find that it is also fully patched, but all domain users have full access to all the information on that system. That may be by design, but it still demonstrates a lack of security controls and something that you may want to explore in a little bit more detail. Let's look at the actual attack. If I'm a bad guy and I were to en engage this environment specifically, I might get my first access on any workstation in the environment. We'll call it workstation one in this case via phishing. Yes, I got phishing on workstation one, shell, first access. There's no sensitive data here, nothing too important. Hmm, the risk would be low, you would think, right? So use MS17010, really, really dangerous vulnerability. An attacker attacks it, gets in, but gets almost nothing from it. On the other hand, there may be sensitive information on that system that you don't necessarily think of right off the top. Since it's got a shared admin, the attacker could use a technique called pass the hash in order to take the admin hash from workstation one, pass it to workstation two, and get system access on the next target inside the environment. Now they have access to a system where the domain admin is logged into, just via standard Windows inherent capabilities. Using that access, the attacker could then pivot laterally to get access to the domain controller directly and have all of the systems, all of the sensitive information on the entire environment. At the same time, the attacker could just skip all of that and go straight to the PII SharePoint because that's where the information that he wants to ransomware is to begin with. These are equivalently bad uh, vulnerabilities. Patching one or two of them, however, might prevent the other ones from being exploited. Let's see that in just a moment. So we've got a couple information disclosures here. We could attack the website, but at the end of the day, the website is somewhat irrelevant from the attacker's perspective. Yes, they maybe could deface it, but none of the vulnerabilities they found there were actually vulnerable to something that could cause a risk to the reputation, let's say, of that organization. Now we move into a really gnarly spreadsheet with all kinds of horrendous colors. And I apologize, I'm colorblind, so I use uh, standard rainbow style colors for everything because they're the only ones I can see. That said, with this kind of rating, we can very quickly see where the bad stuff is, in the top left-hand corner, and where the stuff that we don't need to worry about is too much, the bottom right-hand corner. In this case, we've got a very simple assessment, so the table, the matrix, isn't fully populated, but we've got all the important stuff here. In the very top-hand corner, of course, the highest severity vulnerability we found was MS17010. An attacker will absolutely attack that system because they might be able to find shared local admins that they can use to pivot laterally and attack other systems. Or they may just use that initial access in order to attack the SharePoint directly. Both cases are things that could happen to this environment. Both cases are things that an attacker would want to do to the environment. So we would rate that one a high high as in a double high. The way you calculate the actual severity rating off of this metric, off this matrix, is you add up the number for the severity column and you add up the number from the probability column, right? the threat probability and the vulnerability severity. This gives you, at maximum, an eight. On a scale of one to 10, what we might want to consider using those last two for is a qualitative level assessment where we can go up or down by two. Let's say, for instance, that in looking at the organization, I find out, oh, well, this actually would be a nexus point where you could just cascade your way down and find all kinds of bad stuff. In this case, you could pivot laterally and we, for some reason on our organization, must have all of our PII world readable all over the place. So if anybody at any point can do this and get system level access onto a device, it's really, really bad for us. In that case, you may wanna rate it an extra two. Let's say for instance, you have an Apache struts vulnerability and it's on a website that happens to have control of directly a database with a lot of social security information. Let's just say. In that case, the vulnerability itself is definitely a high, and the attacker is definitely going to attack it because that's where he wants to go. You got double high. If the data wasn't there, if it were somewhere else, and it were stored securely, 
you might just leave it at that, call it an eight. But if it's all there, if the dominoes all collapse in on themselves and fall in a row, then we might want to give it an extra two qualitatively. Doing vulnerability assessment this way allows us as vulnerability assessors a little bit more control because now we have the ability to use a quantitative style risk assessment technique and use qualitative judgment, human judgment, the judgment we're paid to do, to actually give a more accurate rating as well. Be careful about the qualitative assessments because those are, of course, a little bit more prone to standard personal bias. Other vulnerabilities that we, saw, that we find and we are able to just plot might even include informationals that don't have a huge amount of risk. For instance, we might tell the customer that there's a high risk informational where the domain admin's workstation is control concerned or the critical customer data, the PII, is also concerned because in this case, if any other vulnerability allows an attacker to affect that piece of information, we know because of our threat model that an attacker is going to go after that information because that's where the organizational risk is. So it's important to consider your informationals because your informationals may be information from a threat probability perspective or it might be information from a severity perspective. But in often cases, in many cases, they're not both. Sometimes information is pretty valuable to an attacker too. And it's good to plot that. It's good to identify that. And that brings us kind of through most of our vulnerability assessment methodology and framework. The next step, of course, is just to keyboard around a little bit with PowerShell. Specifically, with PowerShell, we've got the ability to automate away so much of the tedium concerned with vulnerability assessments. For instance, if we're trying to find MS17010 in our environment and we have to go from system to system, or maybe we've got an environment where there are 15 different enclaves. Good job logically segmenting the network, but now as a vulnerability assessor, our job is much more difficult because we have to put a scanner behind each one of the enclaves, each one of the firewalls, in order to scan internally. We might be able to get around that using things like PowerShell. Get Hotfix, for instance, is a PowerShell commandlet that we could use to find all of the, say, security patches that are installed. We can also use it to find security patches that aren't installed. For instance, on this slide, if you look down at the check MS17010 section, those are the patch IDs for Microsoft's patch for this vulnerability. If we were to use Windows Remote Management to run that command against all the systems in our environment, we could see where that patch doesn't exist, with the second command in that list, and in finding out where the, where the patch doesn't exist, we now have our vulnerability assessment done. That's exactly what, what uh, Nessus is trying to do from the external. But if we just go on the internal side with Windows R RM, we can get patch information. We can find things like what ports and services are open on systems. If we've identified that a certain service is installed in our environment, let's call it IceCast, and we know that service is really bad, we could use WinRM to identify all of the systems where a process by that name is running. This means we can vulnerability scan without scanning, with just using the internal host information, Windows remote management to enable and empower all of that, and so on. Certain commands like get WMI object have the ability to pull all kinds of information off of the WMI WQL database in Windows. Some kinds of information we might want to consider is also just the operating system information, because this will allow us to identify which system in our environment is the one that's missing that patch, which helps as well. And that brings us to the end of this webcast. So I want to make sure to open it up for questions now so that we have the opportunity to discuss anything that might uh, be triggering or things that you may want to, uh, to get some answers on. Uh, if you want to talk about Windows, Windows RM, we can absolutely do that as well. OK. So our first question, I'm going to jump back a couple slides to, uh, to bring it up here as well, is on the, uh, the risk rating here. Specifically, it's a question about this web directory traversal. Why is that one a high and a high? Well, good question. The answer is it may not be. The important consideration here is, where does that threat probability come from? If the threat probability is focused entirely on what's the chance that somebody would exploit it, then, well, if it's web directory traversal, somebody's going to exploit it. This is a given. It's definitely going to be a high from the threat probability perspective. But is it also a high from a severity rating perspective? And this brings us back to severity ratings from automatically generated tools. You may want to consider 
adjusting your severity rating using something like that Infocon rubric from the Internet Storm Center in order to give yourself a better severity rating than your automatically generated one. For instance, directory traversal may be listed by Nessus or by Acunetics or Nikto as a high. And if we're judging off of that severity rating directly, and we say, okay, anything that Nessus says, that's what I'm going to plug in to this top column over here. Well, then we've got a high. And then with your rating, your rating based on the threat model that you did before, says, well, an adversary is absolutely going to attack this. And that's accurate. Is also a high. Well, suddenly you're conflating rev directory traversal from the external, which is maybe on a website that is pure HTML and actually doesn't have a huge amount of impact were it to be exploited. You're conflating that directly with a vulnerability that could lead to a cascading chain of events that totally pones your network. And they're not things that should be conflated. So you're right. It's a good question. Web directory traversal, depending on the situation, maybe shouldn't be there. Now, there are situations where it might where you might want to consider it there. For instance, if the website is, like say Equifax, a website that has significantly sensitive information on it, and you can web directly traversal your way through to find that information and uncover it, it could absolutely be a high severity, critical style vulnerability. This is true. But in most cases, it may not be that at all. And you would want to adjust your severity rating to take web directed traversal and move that down to what's the impact, were it to be attacked, the severity rating, your adjusted severity rating based on some kind of question and answer, true or false rubric, oh, it's a low. In that case, you would plot it here as a low high in the same cell as the network fire shell share full access column, where it's a six. It's a medium vulnerability, it's still something to consider, but perhaps not equivalent to MS17010. Very good question. Uh, in fact, something I meant to highlight, which is why it's actually there, so good call. Any other questions? Oh, yes, uh, criticals. Okay, so the question is, since the scale is on order of fours and it only goes to eight, what about critical vulnerabilities? Um, what about fives? Well, in the case of fives, that's where I would generally recommend putting in that qualitative assessment opportunity for you so that you can highlight criticals. What are some of the questions to, uh, to add in for that? And would you also consider putting that in an expanded rubric? You absolutely could. You could have a critical and a critical column on both sides. And then in that, you do your question and answer in order to find out which ones would fall into there. And you'd have three additional cells here. But an example of what some of those might look like and the way we generally do this tends to be based on what's exploitable in the wild. I will generally not consider something a critical until there is real world activity going on where the exploit is being run and used in the wild. And if it is, well then, and you're vulnerable to it, that could be really, really bad. That's what a critical should be. Things like SQL injection. SQL injection is one of the most commonly exploited vulnerabilities in the wild. If you find that on a system, it's probably a high severity because well, it could be really bad. Let's say it's SQL injection on a credit card database. Really, really bad. And high probability, absolutely. Attackers are doing it in the wild all the time. They're, that's that's definitely a four. The fact that that kind of vulnerability, MS17010 and the Apache Struts vulnerability, all three of those being examples, are being actively exploited by a large number of known intrusion sets in the wild is probably what should be your calculus behind what makes something a high versus what makes something a critical. Now, this is, of course, just a recommendation because for your organization, it could be anything. If there's just no criticals, maybe you want to highlight the highs that are truly the worst with some other kind of grading rubric, and that's fine. But generally speaking, on most, say, assessments where we're the third party performing assessment, our calculus for what makes a critical a critical is, okay, it's double high, but is it being exploited actively in the wild by many intruded sets? If the answer is yes, critical, 10. Hope that answers the question. All righty. Thank all of you so much for joining us on this podcast uh, or this uh, webcast, excuse me. <laughs> it's got screen shares as well as voice. Um, hopefully it was a bit interesting. Hopefully get your mind kind of going on how to do vulnerability assessment, how to make sure that the results of your vulnerability assessment are both iterable and impactful.
and remove a lot of that personal bias from the equation. Hopefully it helps from that perspective. And if it does, we are building right now and we'll soon release a full six day course, uh, it's another SANS course, Security 460. It is, I'm gonna jump back to the very first slide. It is the Enterprise Threat and Vulnerability Assessments course. We handle data on a massive scale, handle large pieces of that information, use enterprise, actual enterprise tools and enterprise firewall systems like uh, Palo Alto's and Cisco switches so that you're, inter you're, you're interacting with the types and categories of systems that you would really experience on a true enterprise level network. It's a bit of a purple course, both a little bit defensive and certainly some offensive in there as well because it's pen test track. And so thank you again so much for joining us on this, uh, this uh, webcast. And if that course pokes your interest, we uh, now have signups for the beta, the first beta of that course live on SANS's website as well. I encourage you to take a look at it. And with that, Carol, I'll uh, turn the webcast right back over to you. All right, yes. Thank you so much, Matthew, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.